hope if that goes well, that could become a regular event. Tonight, our big event is we have a screening of a documentary called Toxic Puzzle, uh, which is um, uh, all about uh, toxic algae, uh, toxic blooms they're called, which actually impact Utah as much as anywhere else in the nation, uh, that are the thought to have led to things like uh, Parkinson's and ALS disease. Uh, this was a four-year movie made by a local film director, uh, Bo Landing, uh, and um, it was always, it's a work of passion for him, so this film talks about how he followed scientists for four years as they figured these things out. Uh, and they got Harrison Ford to do the, the narration of the film as well. It's a, it's a cause dear to his heart as well. So tonight we've got a screening of that film, followed by a Q&A with Bo, who's the, the director of that movie. People get this essentially have a death sentence. If I could discover a new drug, it would help millions of people. The big quest to me was to try find something to treat ALS. This is probably one of the worst diseases known. It's the structure of scientific revolutions. Paul's a risk taker. I've seen the puzzle pieces go down. I think he's a winner. The toxic puzzle has many pieces. One by one, they've fallen into place. Science has opened up doors to a future which is both threatening and yet promising. This is like a slow toxin and it's a silent killer in a sense because we don't know that it's in the water that we're drinking, we don't know it's in the food that we're eating, but we now know that it can cause these uh, neurodegenerative conditions like Alzheimer's disease. By, for people who reach the age of 85, there's a 50-50 chance they're gonna have Alzheimer's disease. And Alzheimer's disease is taking millions of people and it's costing trillions of dollars. Maybe soon, the scientists will lay down the missing piece. Are we closer to a cure? Um, I would say, I don't wanna use the word cure, but I think we're close to uh, prevention and that's better than a cure. Well, when you're this sick, there is never too much hope. Like, you know, if you told me to lick a tree, I probably would. Yeah, I put all my hope in Paul. Because he's the only one that's ever given me like any, like inch of hope. Yeah, thank you all for coming to this event tonight. Uh, I'm really sorry I couldn't be there. A family situation took me uh, away from Utah and from the United States, so I'm right now over in Sweden. But I hope you have enjoyed the film, and I am prepared to answer a couple of questions relating to it. The way I arrive at a film topic or a topic that I would like to do a film about is quite often that I meet a person who tells me a story. And if that person can tell me a story that grabs me, it can be intellectually or emotionally, then I, I feel this is a film I need to make. And that is exactly what happened when I had dinner with Dr. Paul Cox, who is originally here from Utah, and his laboratory, as you have seen in the film, is up in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. And he started to tell me about this new subject matter that he was working, uh, working with. And I said, Paul, this, this, is, this is a film. I, I need to do this. And, and he said, that, that's fine, but you're going to have to sign a non-disclosure agreement because everything I tell you now is secret as long as we are doing the research. And I have never signed a non-disclosure agreement before with anyone, but I did, which meant that I could not publish this film until the scientists published their findings. And that, that's a very rare uh, thing to happen to a filmmaker, but that's also why it took five years before we could uh, start editing uh, the first frames that we shot uh, and finally make a film out of this. Well, obviously, the story he told me from the beginning was that cyanobacteria, or blue-green algae, as we more often call them, um, uh, they produce toxins. And we, we have known that for a long time. These are acute toxins that can, you know, quite often you will see here in Utah too, signs go up that says, don't swim in the water, don't have kids play in the water, don't have your dogs walk into the water. These are the acute 
toxins that cyanobacteria produce. It's a liver toxin, and it, it can actually easily kill a, a dog that walks into the water and licks that. Obviously, a small child is also a small body at severe risk of being poisoned if that happens. But he was telling me about another level of toxins, and this was brand new science. No one had more or less never heard of it before Paul started to look into this in Guam, in, in, in the South Pacific. Um, but he told me bits and pieces. And the title of a film normally comes only at the end of the editing, editing process or while I'm editing, like in this case. I heard scientist after scientist in interviews I shot say, oh, we have this piece of the puzzle now, or we have this piece of the puzzle. And I figured, yes, that's exactly how they work. They are looking for pieces in a puzzle of knowledge. And this is a toxic puzzle, I then say, because they, that, that's what they looked for, that's what they learned uh, through this process. My background as a filmmaker is actually, I am a biologist and environmentalist, that, that's my, my training. But I knew from teenage years that I wanted to work with information, to gather information about situations in, in our environment, wildlife, environment, science, adventure, um, interesting topics to me personally. And if I could find ways of relaying information from the science community to, to a broader general public, that's what I wanted to do. And I started to work on the local newspaper when I was 14 years old in Sweden. And, and I realized the power of mass media. At the time, of course, it was only printed papers, uh, radio and some television. All the rest wasn't there uh, yet. But I felt that people were asking questions and they demanded information and they were prepared to take action if they had the correct information in their hand. And I would, wanted to be that person in the middle between facts and findings and science and, and, and people's activities. So the environmental, the environmental part of this story is very, very important to me. That's why I, I do these things. That's why I've done 150 films for the international market and hundreds of TV programs uh, on related topics. I'm, I am not impartial when I do editing of, of, uh, of a film. I've said ever since I started with mass media that there is no such thing as objective journalism. That's a myth. Facts may be objective. It is 100 degrees. That's a fact. But how I interpret that as hot or cold is an interpretation of facts. And most of the things we read about and hear about are interpretations of facts. Someone is doing those interpretations. It can be a reporter, it can be an editor, but in every step of the way, I, as a director of a documentary film, I can say I'm portraying reality, but with every question I ask, with every cut I make in the material, with every part of the movie, I, I add music to create emotions. That's also relating, putting my relation to the facts uh, in, in a film. So for me, it's very important to actually do films that has a message, uh, to do films that touch people. Quite often I say, I don't know how you reacted to the film you saw tonight. Maybe you got angry. Maybe you got angry at people polluting lakes. Maybe you got angry at me for having done this, that, or the other in the movie. Maybe you got emotional. Maybe you laughed. Maybe you cried. Well, as a filmmaker, you know, obviously I, I want to, to, to get those emotions from you, but I cannot steer your emotions all the way. But I hope that they lead to some kind of action, which is a personal action, or a communal action. That's important for me. Otherwise, I wouldn't be in this business. Since we uh, released this film a year ago, a lot of things have happened. As I said, this is brand new science. And 
I have met scientists in other countries who don't believe in this um, because they've never heard about it or they have never tested the hypothesis that the scientists in Jackson Hole under the leadership of Paul Cox have now proven. But the FDA that gives permissions for clinical trials of uh, medicines or substances that can uh, work in place of medicine have been really quick at giving uh, the, uh, the scientists now both, they've already done phase one clinical trials for ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, and for Alzheimer's. They have now gotten permission. They are underway with the Alzheimer's phase two, and they just got the permission for, for ALS uh, phase two. All of this work is done um, in Dartmouth at the university and the, and the university hospital uh, in Dartmouth. And it's um, obviously not the Nothing has yet been uh, published, but from the phase one clinical trials, we can say that this is really, really promising that the L-serin that we present in the film could be an agent to block the progression of these illnesses. It's not a cure. It's a blocking agent for the progression of the, those illnesses. And why would that be important? But let's say that you have an early onset of Alzheimer's, if we can block the progression for maybe 10, 15, 20, 25 years, uh, there's a chance that we can block it beyond your lifespan instead of having a quick progression of, of Alzheimer's into the ter terrible disease it is. And the same goes for ALS, uh, Lou Gehrig's disease. The problem that we present in, in the film from other parts of the world is also an acute problem here in Utah. I remember last fall I was hiking along the Deer Creek Reservoir here in Heber where I live and I could see the, the scum on the water surface, the green mats just growing in, 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 into the shallows of, of the Deer Creek Reservoir. I'm sure that all of you have heard when, about the fact that Utah Lake is in bad shape certain periods of the year. The Harriman Reservoir is one of the reservoirs that close because of the acute toxicity of blue-green algae or cyanobacteria. But I was really scared last fall, knowing what I now know about the toxins produced. And I could see the kite surfers on, uh, on the Deer Creek Reservoir nonchalantly just going about their business and enjoying the reservoir. They enter the re reservoir on, on a stretch of beach where the authorities do not put posters. They put them at, at recreational entrances around the reservoirs. Um, I don't know if that is the reason why the kite surfers continue doing what they're doing, but I can say that the scientists up in New Hampshire, they know that there is an increased incidence of ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, among people who do frequent water skiing. So take this seriously. It is a serious problem in Utah. And periods of the year when the blooms happen, when it gets warmer, quite often could be early season, but more often at the end of the season. Stay away from green, murky, smelly water. Don't go near it. Don't breathe the air near it. Just be very, very careful. This is a serious problem. In, in a sense, this is a man-made problem, and yet it's not. Blue-green algae or cyanobacteria are the most common organisms on planet Earth, and they have been around for at least three billion years. They were the first organisms on Earth. We have always had them in, in lakes and streams. They are important for the ecosystems. They are the basic food for a lot of organisms in the oceans and lakes. But we make it worse by adding fertilizers that feed them. In, in the 60s and 70s, a lot of human waste, um, we didn't have water treatment plants. Basically, whatever we flushed down the toilet came out in some lake or stream somewhere. Back then, we could put a treatment plant 
at the end of a pipe. That was a very easy way of taking care of a problem. And the problems disappeared in the lakes. Lake Erie is one example. Lake Erie cleared up, turned into a very nice lake. And suddenly we were back again. And what, what's happening now is that we have an intensive industrial agriculture, not least the hog farms in, in Ohio, for example, um, to, to relate it to Lake Erie, with a lot of um, manure produced locally. And what do the farmers do with all the manure? They pour it out on the fields in the wintertime. With the flooding in the, in the spring and, and the thawing in the spring, that material just goes into the lake. And now we're feeding the cyanobacteria again, and they just love it. They grow because they have food. Same thing happens here. What we're doing here in, in Utah is that we are fertilizing our lawns quite often too much. That is also a runoff that goes into Provo River or the streams and, you know, around our lakes and, and reservoirs and we feed the system. You can see the difference between the, the Jordanel Reservoir, which gets fairly clean mountain water where the blooms are not really acute. But as soon as Provo River comes into the Heber Valley, a lot of agriculture here, the Deer Creek turns into a green mess in the, in the early fall. That continues down into Utah Lake and we just add in water body after water body. So we have to start to look. It's very hard to put a, a sewage treatment plant on the landscape. We can't do it. So we have to change the way we're dealing with agriculture, how we produce our food. And that's why, as we said in, in the film, that this problem really starts on our plate. It is what we eat and how we produce what we eat that is now affecting this problem severely. Well, first, make sure that you don't add unnecessary fertilizers into the streams where, where you live. Um, and, and be part of campaigns to, to limit the big industrial food farms, because they are not good. They are not good for our health. They are not good for our environment. So that is part of it. Um, but for me, as a person who deals with film, who is producing information, I think we need to spread the word so that more people are aware that this is a danger so that you can stay away from the lakes when they are green. Stay away from food that comes out of the lake. Don't go fly fishing or fishing in the lakes if you see the green algae blooms because the fish, fish, the fish eats the plankton or eats the smaller organisms in the lake that are feeding on the plankton. And, and the toxins just accumulate up in the bigger fish. So if you fish, put and take, put the fish back in there. If you are going to eat it, make sure the fish comes out of the water during seasons when you don't have algae blooms. That, that, that's at least a start. There are two sources on this topic. One is that you go to the uh, website or Facebook page for the film itself, toxicpuzzle.com or toxicpuzzle on, on Facebook. Or you go to the brain chemistry labs in Wyoming. Uh, and from either of these places, there are cross-references. You will see up, updated information. We have published a lot of bonus material on our website. You can see extended interviews with... Uh, uh, with scientists and so on. And we continue to publish new information because there is new information coming out every day. This is an ongoing, uh, never-ending story. As a documentary filmmaker, you always think, should we make another film when more facts are out there? Yeah, it's, it's possible. But it's hard to make documentary films. It's hard to finance them. It's hard to get the distribution you want. So you need to think twice, and we are thinking twice. But definitely with new information, we, uh, we are keeping our eyes and ears open. We uh, might have a sequel coming.
it's very interesting to see the scientists at the Brain Chemistry Labs, which is a non-profit organization in Jackson Hole. They do all of their work and have done so for the past 10 years or since they started. This is a very rapid development, by the way. They've done that through donations. Where they are today in clinical uh, trials, phase two clinical trials, a pharmaceutical company has normally spent hundreds of millions of dollars. And before a substance can be out on the market, they probably spent a billion dollars. The people up in Jackson Hole have spent around 15, 18 million dollars for all the work they've done. So you get a lot for your buck by donating to a nonprofit organi organization like the Brain Chemistry Lab. So you can go to their Facebook and press the donate button. That's the easiest way of doing it. Some income from um, the publication of this movie also goes back into the research. I think that is very, very important. Uh, and, and that's what you could do. Winning an award for a film rarely brings extra money into your pocket or filling the big deep holes that you always have after uh, having produced a documentary film. But it gives you recognition and it increases the chances of getting distribution for, for a film. Uh, awards are good for that. It gives me a chance to get up on a stage and actually talk to, to people at a festival like that and the word spreads. And, and that's how I see it. And, and you know, we have worked more than six years on this film project. It's heartwarming, too, to know that people actually liked what they saw and were prepared to give you an award. Well, the latest one was to win Best Feature Documentary at the Utah Film Festival and Awards uh, in Provo only a couple of weeks ago. Um, but we also won um, an award at the Impact Docs. Uh, and the Impact Docs is awarding films that, that actually have an impact on society or individuals, uh, films for change. And that is very important to us to win an award like that. So uh, that was very, it, it was good for us, it was good for the film. And we have also been selected for a large number of film festivals. And we're still in the festival circuit, so more festivals to come. To do documentary films is, is hard because financing is difficult. I am in a very privileged situation because I have been doing this for more than 30 years now. I have run weekly um, documentary slots on Swedish TV that I've hosted for almost 20 years on prime time. I have worked for the Discovery Channel since the channel started here in the United States. So recent years, more so for National Geographic and other major broadcasters worldwide. So I can normally knock on a door and they will know who I am and, and they will accept, accept to listen to me and, and quite often accept my proposals. That has become harder and harder for every year because also because the kind of films I do, environmental hard-hitting films, investigative reporting and health films, Surprisingly, these are not topics that a lot of broadcaster wants to have films about. Climate change is up there somewhere these days, but most other topics are not. It has always been a struggle to get these topics across. It, it, it was easier for me to do plain wildlife films that I've done a lot of. Uh, you know, cute animals uh, always finds an audience. Um, but to tell you the truth, this film has not been financed at all my wife, Marianne, and I have put our time during six years into this film. And a lot of filmmakers have offered their time and profession into this film project. And we had a small grant, I call it small, but it was an important financial support from Swedish television. That was important to get this film off the ground. But basically, we, uh, we have self-financed, like so many other documentary filmmakers are doing. And the, uh, the other reason why maybe why that happened was that because I had signed a non-disclosure agreement with a scientist from the beginning, I could not tell the broadcasters what I was up to. 
And if you go to a broadcaster as a filmmaker and say, I have this great film idea. It's about this topic. I don't have a budget. I don't have a timeline. I don't know what the end of the story is. That is a very hard sell. And it's an impossible sell, even for me, to, to, to do. So we gave up asking broadcasters for, for support and decided let's, the, the, the film must be made. And the only may, way we can make it is to do it ourselves and finance ourselves. To have uh, film crews and people backing up a, a film like this is, is very important. And I was so happy when, uh, through personal contacts, we, we got in touch with Harrison Ford and asked him uh, if he could think of narrating this film. He answered yes immediately. He doesn't do a lot of narration of documentary films, so this was a bit unique for him too. One of the reasons why he's backing this project is that he is also living in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. He knows about the scientists and the, the lab they have there. He's very deep into supporting both that science and other science that relates to climate change and, and medical stories. Um, uh, it had a personal angle for him as well, and, and, and he was very moved by this material. And, and we're just so great that, that he helped us narrate this film. Obviously, that helps in distribution too. At least they know who Harrison Ford is. If I should be really honest, I should probably say that documentary films do not make money. But if you make the one film that does, you should just be really happy. I mean, we have, of course, the Michael Moore documentaries that have made hundreds of millions of dollars. The Penguin story from the Antarctica many years ago, uh, and they are doing a sequel to that one right now, also made hundreds of millions of dollars. I mean, equal to good feature films at the cinema. But documentaries, normally, we are all happy if we can recoup the money we have spent doing, doing the film. That, that is the truth. That's why so many documentary films come from the heart of film, from, the, from filmmakers. We have a story we want to tell, and we are, we are prepared to, to make it happen uh, and, and walk through hell and high water to, to get there. But I would never advise, and when I teach filmmaking um, at university and I have film schools, I usually say, don't do this for the money, but do it for the sake of issues that you, you're burning for. And also, we have a lot of fun when we do this work. We get to see the world. We get to meet amazing people. And that makes it worth everything we put into it. Well, Scandi Nature Films, which is our film production company, we've had a studio in Sweden for 25 years uh, with a lot of our own employees, film crews, editors. Uh, moving over to, to uh, Utah, we finally decided it was easier to do all our filming with Utah as a base and not have our post-production in Sweden. Um, but all the people that through the years have worked with us at Scandi Nature are now, are now participating in, in this and other film projects we do as camera crews, and, and they are really good. And of course, we like to work with them. You, you develop a personal relation with people in your film crews, both when you're shooting and when we're doing po post-production, which we're doing here in, in Salt Lake City with huge sound, uh, huge uh, studios down in Salt Lake. Um, very nice people that we have done several films with, both with editing and sound post-production. So Mike Fox, Mike McDonough, Steve Lanieri, who lives here in Heber, has been our sound recordist on, on shoots. And, and I try to use as many of the new relations uh, that we have created here in Utah. Greg Windley, who lives here in, in, uh, in Heber, has shot some of the material. It's, it's, and when you shoot documentaries, you don't go out with a feature film crew of 20 people or whatever. We're quite often only a sound recordist and a camera person, and my wife Marianne as a producer, and, and, and filling in wherever the film crew needs help, uh, and that's how we work.
Normally, when you, you're shooting a film or producing a film, you say the story needs a beginning, a middle, and an end. Uh, and like the French director once said, not necessarily in that order. But when you shoot a documentary like this, I only knew I had a starting point, and that was Paul Cox telling me about the project. I didn't know where the scientific story was going to end, so I didn't know how my film was going to end, or if there was going to be a film at all after five years of filming. But you sit there, like in our case, with 70, 80 hours of interviews and material from around the world, and the story develops in your head. You have main characters. It's like a feature film. You look for characters. You look for character development. You look for stories to evolve. Uh, and uh, f I think it's a very interesting process. You get to know people. Very, I sit there with these scientists. It's like they are lecturing to me, private tutoring for, for a year. And I need to find the pieces that goes together in this puzzle. As, as soon as I had the, the title come to me through the interviews, Toxic Puzzle, the puzzle word, then, of course, I could work on that in the editing process. Um, and it needs to have a climax in the film. I, I can't. Aristotle, thousands of years ago, told us how you tell a story. And, and as a matter of fact, we're still telling the best stories the way he did way back then. We were lucky. One of the few things that we were really lucky with was that we had a distributor who happened to see the film at our first screening in Jackson Hole, uh, which was a preview screening. And, and they decided immediately, we want to distribute this film. Um, that's rare that a thing like that happens that way. But it meant that as soon as we had the world premiere at the Newport Beach uh, Film Festival, we could release uh, this film online because I realized I'm not going to get it on television any anytime soon and we immediately got it on the uh, the streaming platforms iTunes Amazon Google Microsoft TV and voodoo that's fantastic because people can download it for streaming for a couple of bucks or download it to own for a few more bucks uh, and that's how we actually can finance part of this if you do so please tell your family and friends to do it if you like the movie today. That is a, a way of helping us both finance this film project, but also giving some money back to the research. Um, but, but it's key, if, if you're an individual filmmaker, you need a distributor. They know where to take your film, if it is good enough, if the story is good enough, if the technology that you have used is good enough, and so on. Um, um, but it's hard. It's really hard, and that's, that's why most filmmakers attend film festivals and try to get their films shown at film festivals. It opens doors to distributors. And that's the key thing, for example, for Sundance. Once you have your film into Sundance, that normally opens doors for distribution. On the other hand, it's really hard to get in there. We know that. We didn't get in there. Probably the advice I would give someone who is even thinking of doing documentary films is don't do it because it's so hard and it's just going to make you cry that you ever started on this journey. But if they get over that hurdle, I say use your passion. Whatever you are passionate about, whatever your brain, your heart, your emotions tell you, this is an important story to tell, go do it. Technology today is so simple. I mean, we're shooting this with regular SLR cameras, um, and you can even use your, your smartphones to shoot movies. It's, it's good enough. Just remember one thing. Technology doesn't make your movie. Story makes your movie. So find the story. If you're touched by the subject you're, you're, you're interested in, I'm sure some other people will be there, will be also touched by it. And you can reach them through streaming platforms or your Facebook pages or your YouTube channel. There are so many ways of distributing material today that I didn't have when I was a young filmmaker. Uh, and... and uh, Go with your passion. Passion is, 
the number one ingredients for documentary filmmaking, behind the camera and in front of the camera. I just hope that the film community and the overall digital community, what Uden is supporting in, in, in Utah, could continue to develop because um, I just think that the, the whole idea of silicon slopes in, in Utah is so terrific. We have something we can offer that goes beyond just content. We have a lot of know-how here. We have a lot of people with knowledge about all aspects of digital production and, and distribution. We should be a hotbed for, for both filmmaking and digital aspects or digital uh, use of this material. So um, that is my hope for Utah, that the film studio in Park City, huge sound in, in, in Salt Lake and, and other units continue to grow, that we bring more people into Utah for film production, and that we use our passion to fight for things we believe in. And stay out of that green water, please. Thank you for watching tonight. <laughs>